we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we praise him as he should be praised. We thank Allah for all the blessings that we enjoy and most of Allah's blessings upon us, we are unaware of them. And those blessings that we can recognize if we try to numerate them, we will not be able to numerate them. We ask Allah's forgiveness for not being thankful enough even for the blessings that we know of and we remember. We tend to forget all the positive and all the blessings and focus on one negative thing that happens in our lives. As if this world is meant to be perfect and is meant to be Jannah. When Allah has prepared us in the Quran mentally, spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, that this world is a house of tests. It's like someone inviting you to a, an outing. You want to know, are you going to a wedding or you're going to a hike? So that you determine what attire and what shoes you will wear. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us this world is a steep uphill battle, a hike. So dress properly, put the right shoes, put the right heart and carry with you be as light as possible in this world for you will not survive the hike if you load yourself with so much weight my dear brothers and sisters allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us so many blessings at this point in time and at this place we have nothing to complain about alhamdulillah thumma alhamdulillah thumma alhamdulillah if we complain about anything we complain about our sins we complain about our shortcomings we complain about our heedlessness ghafla we complain about disconnection from akhirah and overconnection to dunya. And at this moment, while we're thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we cannot help but to remember our brothers and sisters in Gaza and in Palestine. May Allah Azza wa Jal, during this time of rain where dua is mustajab, may Allah give them peace, may Allah give them safety, may Allah give them security, may Allah give them food. May Allah give them clean water. May Allah clothe them and shelter them and carry them and heal them from every sickness, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We make dua not only for them as Al-Quds and Palestine and Gaza is the heart, right? But it is the whole body is aching. May Allah Azza wa Jal apply the same dua that we have made to our brothers and sisters in Lebanon. Ameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. May Allah give them peace and security and, and, and secure them of fear and feed them of hunger. Ameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. May Allah give the same to the other part of our Muslim body in Sudan. This, the, the, the report is half of the population, 26 million are in, in, in living in starvation, basically. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take the fatil of fitna, the spark of fitna from a Sudan and bring them back as brothers, Ya Rabbil Alameen. May Allah join the hearts of our brothers and sisters in Libya, Ya Rabbil Alameen. May Allah bring peace and security and reward the people of Yemen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala secure them. Just four years ago, the United Nations said that we don't even have a parallel on our records to what was happening in Yemen just four years ago. Not even the First World War, not even the Second World War, on records, there was no famine on a large scale that what was happening in Yemen. And yet, the faqir and the ma'doom and the musafir and the maskeen is the one that stood up and helped and is the one who bonded. May Allah Azza wa Jal bring peace and security to our brothers and sisters in Syria, Ya Rabbil Alameen, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, Ya Allah, may Allah bring peace and security for our brothers and sisters in Kashmir and all the Muslims in India. May Allah secure them of fear and feed them of hunger and increase their Iman, Ya Rabbil Alameen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be there for our brothers and sisters in Burma from the Rohingyas and in East Turkestan from the Uyghurs. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give them thabat on their deen for they have been fought in their deen, in their La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. May Allah accept the least from them for they have been under tremendous pressure and may Allah help us to help them, Ya Rabbil Alameen. 
my dear brothers and sisters, the rest of the Muslim world, you're talking about Somalia, you're talking about the rest of Africa, you're talking about, you know, our brothers and sisters that, you know, suffer economically, maybe in Bangladesh, maybe in Pakistan, you know, maybe in Afghanistan, maybe in even Indonesia. There is poor people in the Muslim world and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give them like what he has given us and better than what he has given us. Ameen ya Rabbil Alameen. We love and we wish for them what we wish for ourselves. That's their right upon us. And as we stand today when we ask what can we do for them, there is an instant, immediate, daily action that we can take that we don't have to wait a minute. One is what we just did, dua. Two is donation. You start with your zakah and you end up with your sadaqah. And you give from that which is beloved to you. This is the time that we prefer others over ourselves. If, not, if, if we don't do al-ithar, if we don't prefer others over ourselves now, when are we going to do it? This is the time now to practice one of the highest branches of Iman. When Rasulullah sallallahu wasallam had a guest and he didn't have anything to offer him, so he asked his friends and no one had anything in his home. So one Sahabi brought the guest out of embarrassment. He couldn't handle that Rasulullah wants someone to host his guest that night and they didn't have something. So this Sahabi takes this man and he asked his wife, she said, we just only have the dinner of the children. She said, keep the children busy. And he turned the light, the, the candle on their side and kept it on his side so that he can see the food. And then his wife immediately had to improvise. She put water in the pot, put rocks, little rocks, pebbles in the, in the water and started stirring them and boiling the water. And the kids were sitting down waiting for the food to be cooked. And as they were sitting down and laying down, they got sleepy and they went to sleep. And the guest ate the dinner of the children. The, he didn't even have dinner for him and his wife. So the Prophet ﷺ called the man and he said, Allah was impressed by both of you for what you have done. What have you done, man? What have you done? That Allah from above seven heavens, he was impressed and Allah smiled and Allah was happy. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, these words in English do not fit. It's like the wrong translation, but you get the meaning. If now is not the time that we go to sleep hungry and we share with our brothers and sisters, then when is the time? One, making dua. Two, donation. Three, activism. We are the voice of the voiceless. We are the voice of the voiceless. People, we are here. We are where the decision is made. And moreover, for us that live in the Silicon Valley, where actually people cannot believe that we live next to Twitter and Facebook and Google and Yahoo and all of these um, companies and Facebook and, you know, they keep on changing their names. We can't keep up with the changing, with their name change, but that's fine. You know, the names are many, but the core is the same. We are living next to them. We can impact the waves start here in the Silicon Valley and then it goes and it spreads around the world. All the social, the trends of the world starts here and it ends up going all over the globe. We are where the decision is made. We are, we, sometimes like we don't think how much we are in a sensitive place. That any person you turn around and talk to might be actually a person with a high position in a high tech company. If you change his mind, you change the world's mind. So we cannot just like live in the Bay Area and in the Silicon Valley thinking that, okay, we're just like living like anywhere else. No, we are living in a very sensitive place that puts a pressure amongst us to learn, to learn about the Muslim world and, to, and, and the, the woes that, that inflict the world, to learn the facts, to learn how to speak about the facts. If after 12, 14 months of slaughter, you still don't know how to put four or five sentences together, historical facts, explaining the plight of Muslims in Palestine, there is something wrong with you. You cannot keep on saying, oh, I'm not the expert. Oh, I don't know. If you don't know how to put back five, six sentences to explain what Islam is, because people are so curious after they saw how the people of Gaza are handling the war. If you don't, they, they want to know about Islam. 
and nobody reads books anymore, and if, unfortunately. I mean, there's still a lot of people, but people like on social media, and they prefer, they don't trust the social media. They trust you, they see you. You can't put five sentences about Palestine together. You cannot put five sentences about Islam together. You cannot like run a presentation and practice and practice and practice at home. If you don't, I mean, reach to the Imams and Shiuch. I'll teach you. But don't sit down being helpless. There's no excuse right now. Because maybe a word that will come out of your mouth will save the bloodshed. If you meet Allah and you saved the life of one human, Muslim or not. Now imagine if he's a Muslim. You, khalas, you inshallah, you're going to Jannah. But Jannah needs some work. Jannah is not, it doesn't get accomplished by me being selfish, self-centered, you know, only worry about myself, right? Let's deal with the pain of the world as if it's our own personal pain. Because if you don't do that, Allah will wake you up and will, will test you with a pain so that you know what pain feels like. So that you know what pain feels like. We don't want that. Spare yourself the test by being on the forefront, by taking the pain of the world personally and knowing how to speak about it. Activism takes different place. Social activism, economical activism, political activism, you know, just in the season behind, you know, it was voting still. According to statistics, only 20% of Muslims vote. When are we going to vote if we're not going to vote now? When? You know, we have to keep on repeating history. Oh, they came for the Catholic and I said it wasn't me. They came for the thing and they went to the Jew and I said it wasn't me. Then when they came to me, there was nobody to stand for me. You know, the, the, this, this very famous statement from a European uh, journalist in Germany. My dear brothers and sisters, these are the instant things. But now we ask a question, what about the long-term things? What, what do we do on the long term? On the long term, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us a road map. The road map that if we don't figure out a way where we can support one another, work together as a community, and find a way that we can parent and grow our children to be something that will change the world. When I say this, even me, you know, when you hear this, it sounds like a cliche. Let's raise our children. So inshallah, maybe our children will change the world. It sounds like uh, you're just trying to run. But actually, after really reading the Quran again and again and again, it struck me that every time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to bring a change to the world at its darkest time and age, Allah Azza wa Jal will talk about raising a child to change the world. At the end of the day, it was Nuh alayhi salam. Nobody would believe in him except very few. It seems you can count them under 10. But he turned into his children and raised his children. Sam, Ham, and Yafith. And the oldest one drowned. But it was a story of raising children. When Ibrahim alayhi salam they say it's the same story of Musa alayhi salam was with Ibrahim and Namrud saw a dream and he started killing children right and left. So the mother of Ibrahim alayhi salam went to a cave and raised him inside the cave. In some of the stories, you know, Ibn Kathir and this, they say the father didn't even know that his wife was pregnant. The mother, the mother of Ibrahim alayhi salam hid her pregnancy from her husband because she, she knows her husband is so sincere to the king, he will kill his own child. Sounds familiar? When you're sincere to the enemy against your own people. <laughs> Subhanallah, Ibrahim alayhi salam, Allah tells us, gives us a hint that we think he started da'wah when he had a long white beard, big turban. Allah said when he went and challenged his people, qalu sami'na fatan yadhkuruhum yuqalu lahu Ibrahim. We heard a young man, fata in Arabic has to be like around 16 to 22. Young, agile, strong, you know, Bouncing all over the place with a lot of energy. Fata. Subhanallah, Ibrahim alayhi salam starts his da'wah. No, the only one that listens to him is his wife, Sarah. He goes from Iraq, from Ur in Iraq, to Huran. You know, after he challenges the Namrud and, you know, destroys the idols and thrown in the fire. He goes to Huran, he finds them. This is southern Syria. He finds them that they worship uh, the stars. He has a debate, they reject him. He goes to Egypt. In Egypt, the king attacks his wife. He takes his wife, long story, and he comes back to Palestine and settles in Palestine. 
And then he raises his hand to Allah Azza wa make dua, Ya Allah, nobody's believing in me. At the end of the day, it was Ibrahim and his wife Sarah, then Hajar went with them, then Lut, his nephew. And when Allah sent his Lut to the, his people, no one will believe in Lut except his daughters, raising children. So Ibrahim makes dua, Ya Allah, nobody's believing. Ya Allah, can you please grant me children so that I can raise them as Muslims so that they will worship you because the, nothing else is working. And Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَبَشَّرْنَاهُ بِغُلَامٍ حَلِيمٍ about Ismail alayhi salam. فَبَشَّرْنَاهُ بِغُلَامٍ عليم for Sayyidina Ishaq alayhi salam. وَبَشَّرْنَاهُ بِإِسْحَاق وَمِنْ وَرَاءِ إِسْحَاقَ يَعْقُوبٍ It became generational, Allah, because Sarah was patient and she took the pain and suffering of seeing Hajar becoming pregnant and having a child and she didn't have a child and she never objected to Allah's destiny. She's the one who suggested the idea, told her husband, maybe Allah promised you a son, but maybe not through me. Marry Hajar, let's have a child. Let's raise, even if it's the son of Hajar, I'll raise him too. Look at the Iman, she sacrificed herself. That's why when the Bishara came to her, Allah didn't give her a Bishara of one child, a son and a grandson, double, because of her sabr, seeing Hajar and her son Ismail having a child. Subhanallah. What became the story of Ibrahim? Ismail alayhi salam. And from that, children of Ismail, some of the Mufassirin say Al-Asbat are actually the children of Ismail, not the children of uh, Israel, which is Sayyidina Yaqub alayhi salam. And some say it's the children, we don't matter, we don't dis discriminate between the prophets. But from the children of Ismail comes Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And from the children of Ishaq, Yaqub. And from Yaqub, 12 children. Where is the big da'wah? Where is the big op There is no operation. There is no big da'wah operation. There is having children, turning them to Muslims. Having children, turning them to Muslims. From Ibrahim to Ismail and Ishaq. Ismail and Ishaq to the 12 children of Ismail. Then Ishaq, then Yaqub, Israel alayhi salam. And then the 12 children of... Then, subhanallah, comes the big change in the world. Yusuf becomes the prince of Egypt. How did that happen? How did the world wake up one day with number two man in the world is Yusuf alayhi salam. It's a story of raising children. And then when Allah wanted to change the reality of Pharaoh killing the children of Israel, it was raising a child. It was growing, nurturing, rising a child. Musa alayhi salam, you all know the story, I don't have to tell you. What's the story of change to the Israelites? In the darkest moment in history for believers, where you are not only under slavery, but we're going to kill your children. And by the way, we're going to keep you alive because we need you to reproduce. Because this is a temporary. They keep you alive. And we're going to kill the children and we're going to keep the parents alive. You know, right now when there is collateral damage, unfortunately, that they actually have this name. But they say, oh, we didn't mean to kill children. We didn't mean. We didn't. No, no. Pharaoh went up and said, <clears throat> we're going to kill children. Policy. We're not hiding it. We're not sugarcoating it. We will kill your children and keep you alive. Deal with it. So imagine you're not only under slavery, but your children are being killed. How do we change the situation? Very dark. Bring a child, raise a child. When darkness took over, you took, you look story after story at the time of Isa alayhi salam, which is very similar to our times right now. If you were Isa alayhi salam, you are raised like a Palestinian child today. Why? Because when Isa alayhi salam walked out of his house, Isa alayhi salam walked out of his house, he saw the first soldier, an Israelite soldier. Because there was a Jewish king, Harold Jr. So Harold Jr. has children. Uh, Harold Sr. had children and he died before Jesus was born and uh, by four years and then Jesus was born under Harold Jr. This Harold Jr. was a sellout, him and his father. So the father, said, when the Romans came, he said, listen, we're not going to fight you. What do you want from me? They said, we want to control this area. He said, keep me a king. I'll, do, I'll make all of your wishes come true. So they said, you're not going to resist? He said, you're not, I'm not going to resist. He completely gave it up. So the Jewish community started boiling. What just happened, man? They came and we give them the whole country on a golden platter. No resistance, no jihad, no fighting. He said, that's what you got. What did Harold Sr. do? One, he built shopping centers and malls. Two, he built so many public parks. Three, he built so many public theaters and brought singers and live theater play. Does that sound familiar? Recently, how do we make the masses 
forget about what's going on. Give them entertainment. Give them shopping. Give them goods. You know, talk about something else. Exactly what happened 2,000 years ago before Isa alayhi salam was born. Isa alayhi salam was born. The father died. He divided his kingdom into five kingdoms, gave every child one kingdom. And Isa was born under her junior. How do we change this dark situation? Imran and his wife are praying, Ya Allah, this is very humiliating. We're living under occupation. How do we change the situation? Ya Allah, the only way we can see it is to have a child. Qalat Rabbi inni nadhartu laka ma fi batni muharrara. Ya Allah, I give nadhar. What is in my womb is for you. We need a change. So Allah gives her not a boy. He gives her a girl. Maryam alayhi salam. Maryam is like, okay, we need a change. Zakaria looks at that and says, Ya Allah, I've been making dua my whole life and I will never give up. You give Imran who's 93, his wife is 83. You give them Maryam. Ya Allah, give me a child. And Allah tells him, Ya Zakaria, inna nubashiruka bi ghulamin ismuhu Yahya. We bring Yahya to the scene. How do we change the world? How did the stories of the prophets and messengers? Raising, growing, rising a child. So Imran and his wife rise Maryam, but they both were so old. Maryam's story is like Prophet Muhammad's story. She was born, her father is dead. Six years later, her mother was dead. So she went and was raised in the house of Zakaria. And as she became a teenager, like in her teens, Yahya was born. So she even helped a little bit raise Yahya alayhi salam because she was in her khala's house. Then they grow up. Then now we need a big change. So Maryam alayhi salam bears a child which is Isa again raising a child Isa walks out of his house alayhi salam he walks out he first sees the the, the Jewish soldier who, who's treating him with harsh harshness and has a inferiority complex few steps after is the Roman soldier and the Roman soldiers humiliates the Jewish soldier because they're under occupation you're working for us sounds familiar a Palestinian kids walks out of his house First, the Palestinian soldier, then the Jewish soldier. And the Jewish soldier, the Israeli soldier, humiliates the Palestinian soldier right now. And the Palestinian child is raised exactly like Isa alayhi salam was raised. What is the long-term change? Is communities. You see, what you cannot see in the story of Isa alayhi salam, there is a community. The story of Isa is seven stories in one. Imran and his wife, Zakaria and his wife, Maryam, Yahya, then Isa. And how were they able to raise amazing children like that? through a community come together to bring up a child. I don't know how to say another word. I hate the word raising and I like the word rising, growing, because the word raising applies for raising cattle and raising chicken. And at, at the end of the day, you raise them. They're very nice, very well behaved, but they're only good for slaughter. And it seems we've been doing very well, very good job in raising, because at the end it seems everybody gets slaughtered. We need to stop raising and start rising. May Allah Azza wa Jal grant us hikmah and knowledge. Aqulu ma tasma'una wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum Alhamdulillahi wahdah wa salatu wa salamu ala man la nabiya ba'dah Allahumma ya musabib al-asbab sabib lana asbab al-khayri ya rabb al-alamin My dear brothers and sisters Even when it came to our dear and beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Allah created a destiny that no one will grow this child except Allah Father is gone so that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam doesn't learn from his father Maybe he would have learned the adat of jahiliyyah Father is gone Mother six years mother is gone Grandfather Grandfather, two years, gone. Then he's at the house of Abu Talib. Abu Talib is very busy. He doesn't have time to spend a lot of time with Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He has 10 children. He's the leader of Quraysh. So in a way, the formative years of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, Allah raised him, protected him from shirk, protected his fitra. And then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam understands this sunnah. He's still not declared as a messenger. And at age 25, he gets married. Khadija gets a gift from her uncle. Who's the gift? It's a slave, Zayd ibn Haritha. Who's raised in the house of the Prophet Zayd ibn Haritha. Never for a day did he treat him like a slave. 
Then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa knows Allah's sunnah in the cone. He goes to Abu Talib. He said, Abu Talib, you took care of me when I was a child. Look at the emotional intelligence. Look at the consideration, social consideration. Look when you do goodness to someone who deserves. He comes back and he said, you took care of me as a child. Give me one of your children to take care of him as a child so that I lighten the load, your load. On his way to Abu Talib, he finds Hamza. Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Asadullah, he has the same intention. Hamza walks out with Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam walks with Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ali ibn Abi Talib becomes copy of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ja'far ibn Abi Talib becomes copy of Hamza. The lion of the desert, hmm? Sayyidina Hamza, you get another lion in Ja'far. The Rasulullah sallallahu says, Ana Madinatul Ilmi wa Aliyun Babuha. That I am the city of knowledge and Ali is the gates. And look at the power when Rasulullah raised. Who's the first Muslim? First Muslim, a woman, Khadija radiallahu Man or woman? A woman, Khadija radiallahu Who's the second Muslim? Ali ibn Abi Talib. The second day Sayyidina Ali embraced Islam. Who's the third Muslim? Zayd ibn Haritha. Look at the prospects of this deen. How much prospects would you give for a religion, a movement that starts with a woman at 10 years old before puberty and a 12, 13 years old slave that became free and Rasulullah adopted him? What are the prospects? How much success would you give? But the people that he raised, they stood up with him immediately. And all of these children that became Muslims at a young age, as Zubair ibn al-Awwam, 16 years old, embraces Islam, and some say younger. Abu Ubaidah Amr ibn al-Jarrah, 18 years old. Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, 17 years old. You name after name after name. Ammar ibn Yasir, 18 years old. They all embraced Islam in their young teens. Story of surviving is a story of upbringing a generation, and that